Um, so it is my pleasure today to uh, introduce Professor Andrew Schwartz. By way of background, uh, he is the proud of Brown University, where I didn't know that you studied civil engineering as an undergrad. Um, he did his JD at Columbia University, where, among other things, he served on the Columbia Law Review. Uh, after Columbia Law, he clerked for Judge William Fletcher of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and uh, Judge uh, Naomi Reese Buckwald of the U.S. District Court uh, for the Southern District of New York. Uh, following his clerkships, Professor Schwartz practiced corporate law in New York at Wachtell, uh, where uh, I did a, a sometime co-professor of mine, Jason Lynch, who's uh, general counsel at Foundry Group, was a colleague uh, alongside Professor Schwartz. Um, and since 2008, he's been teaching at Colorado Law School. He teaches and publishes in the areas of corporate securities and contract law. Uh, among other uh, duties, he has been a visiting professor for seven years at the University of Auckland, which sounds more like a privilege than a duty, doesn't it? Uh, he's a Fulbright research scholar, and his scholarship has been published in a number of leading law reviews, including UCLA, Minnesota, Notre Dame, as well as uh, the top specialty journals, including the Yale Journal of Reg on Regulation and the Harvard Business Law Review. Uh, that scholarship has been not surprisingly recognized through several awards, including the AALS Scholarly Paper Competition and the Federalist Society Young Legal Scholar Paper Competition. At Colorado Law, he's also garnered uh, several awards, including the Provost Award for Faculty Achievement and the Gilbert Goldstein Faculty Fellowship, which uh, goes to a professor who's doing really interesting work and gives some research, uh, re uh, teaching relief uh, for research. Uh, additionally, and more personal to me, on, account, on top of all these things, uh, he's really a, a leader in the field, uh, not just in terms of the scholarship that Andrew has produced, but in terms of supporting uh, really generations of uh, legal scholars who have come alongside him, as well as those who have come after him. He launched the junior business, uh, junior scholar I, I, I've been screwing this thing up for 10 years. I ran the thing for a few years. The, the Junior Business Law Scholars Conference, uh, which was just a genius format. Andrew early on thought, wouldn't it be cool if we'd bring 12 or so junior scholars, pre-tenure scholars out to Boulder during the summer, workshop papers together in a really non-threatening, nurturing environment, which became a great way to build a network. And then as uh, other scholars came along, including me, uh, those scholars who were just the right amount of more senior than us brought us along. You handed that bat baton off to me. It was such a great, uh, great event, and I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, he is the author of a book, Investment Crowdfunding, which is the anchor of today's discussion, uh, published by Oxford University Press. This is a topic that hits near and dear to my heart. I teach and write in the areas of venture capital and startup activity, and obviously this is right on point. Um, by way of framing comments, entrepreneurship, including investment into startup and emerging companies, has traditionally been very tied to location. And as between a view that the world is flat, that is, it doesn't matter where you start a company or it doesn't matter where you invest in a company from, or alternatively, a view of the world that the world is spiky, that location is of outsized importance in terms of where you start a company. Location and geography are of outsized importance in terms of where you invest from. Crowdfunding is a really interesting case study insofar as it presents the tantalizing promise to help democratize the world of entrepreneurship and make it less spiky and ideally more flat, thereby, thereby empowering a generation of entrepreneurs and investors to participate in entrepreneurship in a way that was uh, very limited and marginalized before, but, but, there are some real challenges to this as well, including the traditional way that investors and entrepreneurs interact is a function of living in the same proximity to one another. And as we separate out uh, that relationship, there's a series of challenges around that. 
That, as well as other uh, issues, are going to be very interested to hear in today's discussions. Uh, a heads up, after the event, there's going to be a book signing um, outside the courtroom at the panel tables. Uh, and with that, please help me give a warm welcome to Professor Andrew Schwartz. Andrew. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brad, and thank you everyone uh, for being here. Um, he's already mentioned, but let me reiterate uh, a tremendous thanks to the whole Silicon Flatirons team, Nate and Shannon and Sarah and Christine and Brad, of course, and the Tech Law Journal, um, uh, especially uh, Sydney and Nick and Marlena. Um, thanks to all of uh, the, our visiting scholars who are, are here today and our panelists who have come from all across the country I really appreciate you taking the time to discuss this subject that's near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, you, you heard there were a couple of uh, New Yorkers in the house, and uh, one of them I just met, but the others are my parents, Leslie and Ken, who are visiting uh, from New York, so thank you. Um, let me begin uh, what I want to say today with uh, an orientation into our subject. What is investment crowdfunding? Um, and then I'll move on to explaining why, why are we doing this? What's the, what's the purpose? What are we trying to achieve? I'll talk some about international comparisons, looking at uh, other countries where I've, where I've studied uh, this subject as well. Uh, and then I'll, I'll kind of um, spend the last part giving essentially what is the thesis of the book and discussing some of the specific applications of that idea. So just let me begin at the beginning. What is investment crowdfunding? Well, it's, it's like Kickstarter, um, except you get a, a share of stock instead of a product or a tangible reward. Entrepreneurs post their business models and their ideas or information about their companies on a specialized website like Kickstarter. These are called platforms. And uh, anyone across the country is invited to participate, to peruse the various offerings, and to invest in ones that seem interesting to them. Now, um, this would be totally illegal about 10 years ago because the securities laws say it's one thing to offer t-shirts and apps and your name in the credits, as Kickstarter does. You can do that to the public, and, and that's, that's fine. But if you want to offer investment opportunities, you come within the federal securities laws that are almost 100 years old, most importantly, the Securities Act of 1933. And the basic rule of the Securities Act of 1933 is before you sell securities, you must register them with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. To register securities means to provide a thick uh, amount of disclosure about the company and what investors might want to know when they're getting into it. If you don't register the securities and offer them to the public, that's against the law. And, and uh, the, the, uh, the SEC uh, will bring a lawsuit against you. But the law can be changed at any time, and so it was. In 2012, a huge bipartisan Congress passed a law called the JOBS Act, J-O-B-S, standing for Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act. And in the JOBS Act, which was signed by President Obama in April of 2012, it created a new exception called formally an exemption, a new exemption to this rule that you must register securities before offering them. Um, and this new exemption is, I call it, 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 I call it investment crowdfunding. And this new exemption has a whole set of rules of its own. Um, if you want to raise money in this way for your company, you must go through an independent third party platform. You can't just sell securities straight to the people which makes it, by the way, very different than initial coin offerings, NFTs, all sorts of other things that are sold directly. Um, these platforms are themselves licensed 
by the SEC or analogous foreign regulators like the FMA uh, in, in the UK. Um, uh, there's, an, there's a limit called uh, an issuer limit. You may only raise a company, an issuer, an issuer of the securities, may only raise $5 million annually in this fashion. If you want to do more, you can go do a traditional IPO like we see on Wall Street um, all the time. Um, as for disclosure, you don't need to register the securities and file the normal S1 full IPO um, uh, uh, disclosures, but under the US, uh, under the JOBS Act, there is a set of mandatory disclosures that must be provided, much simpler than a traditional IPO, but they are uh, there are certain items that must be included, like financial statements um, and, and other things. I'm going to talk later on about uh, international comparisons and several other countries um, like the UK and New Zealand do not require any mandatory disclosure in, in this way. They, they just let companies decide uh, what, what to disclose. But coming back to the US uh, and, and elsewhere, one of the other rules of investment crowdfunding is that not only are the issuers limited in how much they can sell, but the investors are also capped in how much each investor may invest. And in the US law, in the JOBS Act, it's kind of a complicated formula based on a percentage of your net worth. Um, in other countries, uh, it's something simpler, like in Australia, $10,000 per company. You're not allowed to invest more than that. that. That's a rule. And the idea is that these are unregistered securities of startups, and they're speculative. And it's OK to invest in them, but we don't want anybody to put their life savings into one of these sorts of things. Um, and then the final basic rule of investment crowdfunding is, I call it, uh, it's not just me, I call it all or nothing. When, and this comes from Kickstarter. This comes from the, as crowdfunding has been practiced for a long time, the entrepreneur, the startup company, has to announce at the outset a certain minimum funding target. We need to raise $200,000 and a time frame to do it over the next three months. If investors don't pledge up to the target amount, it's not popular. If the time comes and goes, the whole thing's ca called off, Nobody hands over their money, no securities are issued. And, but if the crowd likes the plan and invests up to or over the minimum, then the deal goes through. And this is sort of a trying to harness the wisdom of the crowd to figure out which companies should be funded and which should not. So those are the basic rules. And let's take a look, if we can, um, at what is the state of the market. I have a couple of slides that are mostly uh, graphs, one chart, I'll confess. Um, so what I've got here is the Jobs Act passed in 2012, but it in the statute, a variety of items were assigned to the SEC to determine by regulation. And it took the SEC several years. They had other things to do at the time, um, like Dodd-Frank. Um, but the SEC only finally put out the regulations in, uh, in I think, in two, uh, maybe the late 2015 or 2016. So the first year of investment crowdfunding in the U.S. was 2016. And so in that first year, there weren't even 200 offerings. But as you can see, it's grown very rapidly. By 2019, there were uh, about 700. And in the most recent year that I have data for in the book, 2021, about 1,500 companies tried to raise money in this way. And as an aside, overwhelmingly, probably 70 or 80 percent hit their funding target and were funded. So almost all of them succeed. Um, here's just another chart uh, sort of showing similarly the growth over the last few years. This is how much money was raised each year by crowdfunding companies all, all told, uh, you know, ac across the country. And as you could see, it, it, in millions of dollars in the first year or two or three, it wasn't even $100 million in the whole country for all companies 
and all investments. But more recently, it really jumped up to in the 400s, uh, uh, $400 million a year. And this has, I feel uh, that as a matter of fair disclosure, I should tell you, this chart looks like it's zooming to the moon. In fact, what's happened over 22 and 23 is that it stayed pretty high, I think, at, at about this level, roughly 500 a year, which, given that venture capital and other sources of funding drop tremendously, is sort of a, a very nice showing, but I don't want to give you the wrong idea here. Um, so, uh, and just, just uh, um, uh, of these, uh, there, uh, of the 1,000 or 1,500 companies that sought to raise money, more than 100 each year, more than 100 companies raise more than $1 million uh, each year. So there's, there's a good bunch of uh, sort of larger uh, raises here. And so, so that's kind of the state of the market and the basics of how it all works. What's the point? Why did the US Congress pass the Jobs Act to amend the Securities Act and allow this sort of, uh, this, this sort of market? And there's, in my view, and, and I talk about this in the book, it, there's really three primary goals that, uh, that, that Congress was seeking. And goal number one was simply to provide a new source of capital for startup companies. Startup companies are really valuable to the economy. They create new jobs, they develop new products, plenty of them don't make it, but those that do really uh, have an outsized uh, impact on our economy. Um, and so, one, the, the first goal is just, let's just get some more money to startups. And as you can see, it's, it's, it really grew very quickly and we're at $500 million a year. To give another bit of perspective, that is less than 1% of VC funding in the US per year. So it's growing very fast and we'll see what happens, but it still is quite small. I keep talking and mentioning other countries uh, because I've kind of I've spent the last 10 years traveling around the world and talking to people in the industry, talking to lawyers, talking to uh, professors. And um, in other countries with a little bit more experience, like the UK, where crowdfunding started earlier, um, it's actually grown uh, to be larger than angel investing in the UK. Um, and is, is kind of hot on the heels of VC. So uh, we'll see what happens. The UK started their market in 2010, so have at least a five year head start on us. So let's see what happens in the future. So the first goal is to provide funding um, for, uh, uh, for startups. But the second is, excuse me, and let me uh, move to my next slide. This is a similar chart showing the number of investors, how many people are participating in this. And in the early years, not even 100,000 uh, people in the whole country were. These days, it's more like a half million uh, and growing. Um, but the idea here really was the policy goal is, and we talk about venture capitalists, we talk about angel investors. Why do startup companies sell stock to venture capitalists, angel investors, friends and family? It really goes back to the law. Remember, if you want to sell securities, you must first register those securities with the SEC, unless there's an exception, an exemption. And there's two very important exemptions that have been used for a long time. One of them is for so-called private placements. If you only sell securities to the entrepreneur's friends and family, you don't have to register them. Another one, another key exemption is for accredited investors. Accredited means either a professional investor, uh, like a college endowment or something, or a wealthy individual who has more than a million dollars to spend. But if you sell, if a startup were to offer securities to people of modest means or who aren't connected with the company, they would have to register the securities, don't want to do that. The effect is that for several decades, startup companies have studiously excluded the broad public from investing. And maybe there's some wisdom to that, but as uh, President Obama thought, and, and I agree, um, the American people should be given at least some chance to invest in this asset class. And so investment crowdfunding 
one of the key, in fact, defining features of the form is that it's open to all investors, not only accredited investors. So it's designed to be a more inclusive sort of market on that side. The third policy goal of investment crowdfunding is also about inclusivity, but it's from the other side, the entrepreneurs. The statistics and anecdotes of uh, women and minorities and rural entrepreneurs trying to get funded by venture capitalists is, is, is uh, not very good. Um, people that are out of the loop, if you don't have a rich uncle and you live far from Silicon Valley, it's going to be hard to get your company funded. Um, and so the third goal of investment crowdfunding is to create a more inclusive and uh, equal opportunity market for entrepreneurs who might have a good idea but need funding. And so this gives them a chance to pitch to the whole country. Um, and so what we've seen in this area, at least just, um, you know, just taking statistics here, um, and again, to be fair, these statistics are maybe a little bit um, uh, making the venture capital numbers look a little bit worse than they might uh, be. Um, but this, in broad strokes, this is roughly right. What we've got on the blue side is the percent of, uh, on one side, female founders who were funded by, or, or the percentage of venture capital companies with a female founder, and it's not even 10%. In investment crowdfunding, we've seen at least of the larger, what I've charted here is the million dollar plus, the largest, because I think they're more comparable, the largest um, raises on investment crowdfunding in a given year to 2021, nearly half of the founders of the companies that raised money were women. And if you move over to minorities, uh, in the VC world, it's maybe 20 something percent and maybe it's 40 something percent. Uh, in investment crowdfunding. If we were to look specifically at African-American founders, the numbers that I've seen, and it's a little bit anecdotal, are somewhere in the range of maybe 1% of the funding uh, of VCs goes to African-American founders, and maybe it's 4% for investment crowdfunding, um, which is a huge, a huge rise. And beyond just kind of, isn't it the right thing to do that everyone should have a chance to you know, get their company funded, um, it's really, there's huge social benefits from this. Because think about it. Um, on the upside, these 1,500 companies a year that get funded, some of them are really going to do great things. Hire people and develop new products and improve our standard of living. On the downside, worst case scenario is that some company goes out of business and $5 million is lost. And the individuals who invested, the most, they were capped on how much they could lose by, let's say, $10,000 in that investment. So what we're dealing with is basically unlimited upside, capped downside, and there's really a, a, a you know, great opportunity, I think, for um, pro-social uh, benefits here. Let me move on. So the, I've defined for you kind of what is the topic and what is the policy goals raise more money for startups, inclusivity for investors and entrepreneurs. And let me move on to uh, an, an, an international report. What I have here on the chart here is for each year, various countries, the US, the UK, New Zealand, and Australia, um, I guess I should have given Australia green, I'm sorry. Um, but. The, what I'm charting here is on a per capita basis. It's not fair to compare New Zealand with a population of 5 million to the US with our 330 million. But on a per capita basis, how much money is being raised? As you can see from, just maybe take a look at the green for a second. New Zealand started out, you know, five and six years ago really strong and has stayed quite, quite high. The US in blue on the left is just almost catching up. Australia on the far right, I guess in purple, um, is, <clears throat> has, has really done nicely. Australia started really late in maybe 2018, 2019, which was a little bit embarrassing when they were talking to the New Zealanders, but it turned out to be really useful because Australia had the benefit of looking around the world, which is what I do in the book, and see what's worked, what hasn't. And Australia put together really a quite, uh, quite good set of regulations, and they've 
immediately almost uh, jumped out. But then, as you can see, big red here, um, the lobster backs of the UK are on a different playing field than everybody else. And what is going on in the UK and in New Zealand, these two leaders, this is something that I really wanted to find out. And so among other things, I, was, I went to New Zealand on a Fulbright and I've talked to various people around, uh, around the world. And what I've come up with is, now this is gonna be a little bit hard to see and I apologize, but I've analyzed the different legal regimes around the world and what I've got here is a chart of some of their key, uh, the key regulations in place. So as you can see, licensed platforms, every country requires licensed platforms. There's an issuer limit, roughly about the same across the world. But there are a couple of differences here, and kind of the biggest difference is mandatory disclosure. New Zealand and the UK, I call them the liberal jurisdictions, they really rely on what I'm going to call private ordering. And that's going to be the focus of the last part of my talk. The New Zealand and the UK really rely, instead of relying on a whole lot of regulations and laws as we traditionally have in securities, the New Zealand and the UK really leaves it very much to the market and market forces um, to, uh, to govern and police the market, to make sure there's no fraud, to make sure that when a company uh, raises the money, uh, they don't just go fritter it all away on uh, uh, you know, uh, a company jet or something. Um, most jurisdictions, the US, led by the US, follow what I call the standard model of investment crowdfunding regulation. And I call it standard, first because the US was kind of the first one to have crowdfunding regulation and so uh, kind of set the standard, but it also uses the standard tools of securities regulation, which is mandatory disclosure, file that form with the SEC. And um, what, what I've seen is that these other markets that have really moved away from that, uh, the more liberal jurisdictions, have uh, really much uh, significantly larger markets than the standard uh, jurisdictions. And with no greater levels of fraud or problems or anything like that, basically in each jurisdiction, whether it's the US or the UK or New Zealand, over the last five or eight years, in each jurisdiction, there's been one case of fraud. After thousands, at least in our case, thousands of companies have raised money. There's bad apples in every, in every field, but um, what we've seen is that even in the liberal jurisdictions, without all of these uh, additional regulations, similarly, very low levels of fraud. So this brings me really to my kind of thesis of the book and, and, my, uh, and, and I'll expand on it as with, with the time that I have remaining. So my thesis is basically this. Dramatic. Um, <laughs> Because investment crowdfunding, by the law and its nature in every jurisdiction, is capped at, for the issuers, they can only raise $5 million, or in New Zealand, $2 million New Zealand dollars, whatever it is. The only workable legal regime is one that keeps the regulatory compliance costs to an absolute minimum. If you can raise an unlimited amount of funds, as you can on a traditional IPO on the New York Stock Exchange, and you're seeking to raise $800 million, your you know, um, AMD, uh, it, it's a reasonable thing to have extensive regulations that end up costing several million dollars to comply with. Okay, you gotta raise 800 million, it's gonna cost you 3 million to do it, okay. But you can't spend $3 million in compliance costs to raise $4 million. Right? So just as a matter of math, the regulations and the legal structure has to, or people just won't use it. And there have been instances of this. Ontario put out, uh, maybe in 2016, uh, an investment crowdfunding regulation that was onerous in its regulations and had a very low amount that you can raise. 0.0, .0 companies ever tried. 
The only way that you can have this regime, we already have the highly regulated public offering that exists. This is for a different purpose. And so because it's only 5 million, it used to be, by the way, 1 million, the SEC raised it in 2020 when it made a few other moves in kind of the liberalizing uh, direction. Um, because the limit is only 5 million, compliance costs just need to be kept to a minimum um, or it just won't really work. So that means, and this is what I'm gonna talk about just in my last few minutes, what that means is that, and this is what I spend the bulk of the book on, is that policymakers and regulators need to think carefully and put in as spare and light a regime as possible. They need to think carefully about which aspects will be addressed through private ordering market forces. And, but there are some places where we do need law and regulation, but we just need to really be very efficient and only use it in a very targeted way to facilitate and uh, assist the private ordering method. Now, I've used this term private ordering a whole bunch of times. What do I mean by it? What I mean is uh, market forces, economic incentives, everything but the law, everything but the law. And in the book, I talk about a whole variety of powerful private ordering methods in investment crowdfunding. I only have a, a, a few minutes left here, so let me just give you a flavor with a few of the highlights of some of the non-legal private ordering methods that uh, the law can look to bolster and rely on as opposed to replace. So. Number one, I call it gatekeeping. Gatekeeping, remember, to sell securities in investment crowdfunding, the entrepreneur must get listed on one platform or another. These platforms are themselves private companies that are trying to make money. They make money when people come and, and buy uh, stock, they get a little bit of a transaction fee. Um, these platforms, if they were to allow a fraudulent company onto their platform and investors buy in and then lose their money, those investors are not coming back. And those investors will go to some other platform. So the platforms have a very powerful economic incentive to be pretty strict with which companies they let list. And in fact, talking to platforms across the world, the leading platforms in various countries reject 90 and 95% of the companies that request to participate and only present uh, this slice. Um, and this really acts to protect the investors by kind of giving them a curated set of investments. Um, just one or two other examples of the private ordering that I'm talking about. Um, one other one uh, that, that, I, that I would say is um, uh, syndication. I call it syndication. And the idea is this. Crowdfunding companies under the law may simultaneously, or you know, one after the other, but simultaneously has become kind of the norm in the more mature economies in the UK and New Zealand, can simultaneously raise money from a venture capital fund, for example, and run an investment crowdfunding offering. The company, so this works really well for all concerned because a venture capital company, uh, a venture capital fund that has done careful research and is putting hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars into the company, um, they, they act as sort of a lead investor and the whole crowd can say, well, if this investment, excuse me, if this VC fund has done so much work and knows this company so well and is willing to invest that much, and I'm being to invited to invest on the same exact terms, I'd join that syndicate, let me do it. So th this way it allows investors to invest $250, $500 in a company that has been vetted and, and reviewed by some experts out there and can come along. So that's another, private, non, it's not ordered by the law, but that's another way that uh, investors are protected and, and the market uh, works uh, without legal compulsion. So in the book, I discuss a number of other private ordering methods, but my basic conclusion is that 
Um, investment crowdfunding has huge potential for upside, totally unlimited, and very modest and cabined downside. To make the system work, the legal framework needs to be what I call liberal, very spare and low cost. And if, and the US is moving in that direction, as more and more countries um, get this message and uh, reform their laws to be more liberal, like the UK and New Zealand, I think that uh, investment crowdfunding is really going to be uh, a significant force across the world. So thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you.